Ooh, wait. Please join me in the prayer of illumination. Open, Lord, my eyes that I may see. Open, Lord, my ears that I may hear. Open, Lord, my heart and mind that I may understand. So shall I turn to you and be healed. Amen. Our reading today comes from Genesis 22, 1 through 14. Of these things God tested to Abraham. He said to him, Abraham, and he said, Here I am, he said. Take your son, your holy, your only son, Isaac, Isaac, whom you love, and go to the land of Moriah, and offer him there is a burnt offering on one of the mountains that I shall show you. So Abraham rose early in the morning, saddled his donkey, took two of his young men with him and his son Isaac. He cut the wood for the burnt offering and set out and went to the place in the distance that God had shown him. On the third day, Abraham looked up and saw the place far away. When Abraham said to his young men, Stay here with the donkey. The boy and I will go over there and and we'll worship and then we'll come back to you. Abraham took the wood of the burnt offering and laid it on his son Isaac and himself carried the fire and the knife. So the two of them walked on together. Isaac said to his father Abraham, Father, and he said, Here I am, my son. He said, The fire and the wood are here, but where is the lamb for the burnt offering? Abraham said, God himself will provide the lamb for the burnt offering, my son. So the two of them walked on together. When they came to the place that God had shown him, Abraham built an altar there and laid the wood in order. He bound his son Isaac. He laid him on the altar on top of the wood. Then Abraham reached out his hand and took the knife to kill his son. But the angel of the Lord called him from heaven and said, Abraham, Abraham. And he said, Here I am. He said, Do not lay your hand on the boy. Or do anything to him, for now I know that you fear God, since you have not withheld your son, your only son, from me. And Abraham looked up and saw a ram caught in the thicket by his horns. Abraham went and took the ram and offered it as a burnt offering instead of his son. So Abraham called that place, the Lord will provide. And as it said to this day on the mount of the Lord, it shall be provided. The grass withers, the flowers fade, but the Word of God will stand forever. This is the Word of God for the people of God. God. Thanks, Phil. All right, I'm going to start off with a confession taught in in public speaking, never begin with an apology, but they didn't say anything about a confession. I've been having misgivings about this passage, this sermon text, ever since I chose that to be preached on today. That's because I'm preaching from perhaps the most troubling and problematic text in all of the Hebrew Bible, the Old Testament arguably the whole Bible. I'm preaching on the story of Abraham and his willingness to sacrifice at his own hands his son Isaac. Genesis 22. Let us pray. Gracious God, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of each heart here be acceptable unto you, O God, my rock and my redeemer. Amen. This is one of those stories, pericopes, if you will, from the Bible that is so well known, perhaps because it is so troubling, that it has its own name. The rabbis call it, in Hebrew, the Akedah, meaning the binding, the Akedah of Yishak, the binding of Isaac. In the story, the patriarch Abraham is 
quote, tested by God, who instructs him to take your son, your only son Isaac, whom you love, and go to the land of Moriah and there offer him as a burnt offering on one of the mountains that I shall show you. And Abraham willingly does so. Well, he almost does so. Abraham did dutifully saddle his donkey and took his young men with him and Isaac and went on a journey to the land of Moriah. There he left the donkey and the others and takes Itzhak, some wood kindling, fire and a knife, to the mountain to build what in Hebrew is called the Holocaust, the burnt offering. However, in a very dramatic portion of Genesis narrative, Isaac quickly notices the conspicuous absence of an animal there for sacrifice. He asks his father hauntingly, the fire and wood are here. But where is the lamb for the burnt offering? Abraham said, God himself will provide the lamb for a burnt offering, my son. So the two of them walked on together. Irony. Abraham then ties his beloved Isaac to the altar upon the kindling and draws his sharp knife to kill him. And at that climactic moment, an angel of God calls to Abraham and stops him from the murder. The angel offers a nearby ram for the sacrifice. Abraham subsequently prepares and offers it. Imagine this story for a moment. Let it sink in. A father, a loving father, is told by God to kill his own son. A son he waited more than a hundred years to be born and offer him as a burnt offering, holocaust to God. This is a terrible, meaning terror story. Imagine Abraham in his mind and heart. Imagine Isaac. It's a horrific story. Such are the cause of my misgiving. Recently, I saw a photograph of a baby. Let this sink in for a moment. An innocent, beautiful baby dressed in the garb and would-be lethal hardware of a terrorist suicide bomber. The child didn't dress himself. Proud parent did that. Imagine a parent... Any parent anywhere dressing their infant as a suicide bomber. Who would want their child killed, blown up in the act of killing others? And yet parents of older boys and girls, teenagers and so forth, proudly sending them to fiery deaths as martyrs in places such as Iraq, Syria, Afghanistan, Somalia... in accordance with certain, quote, religious teachings that espouse that God not only wills their action, but will abundantly reward it. In a holy, evil, perverse, and misguided way, those children are would-be Isaacs on a different mountain, listening to some other voice they call God. But the ending is different. They spare the ram and kill the child. Such was the underlying narrative of 9-11. But it's not just the Muslims or some other faith. A few years ago, a Christian father, and I should use Christian in quotation marks because it's certainly not very Christ-like, but a professed Christian, self-professed Christian father was sent to prison for starving his infant son to death because his sister was told by God for him to do that. And let's not forget the horrible Andrea Yates case. These 
are just a few examples. With all that as preface today, I have Abraham's test of Isaac to preach on again. To preach it anew and afresh in a world that seems to misunderstand it all too well. In fact, one of uh, the professors at my alma mater, Perkins School of Theology at Southern Methodist University, while I was there, preached a sermon on this and announced he would never preach it again for fear of it being misconstrued in a way suggesting God encourages the murder of anyone. Well, I think that's kind of understandable, but I also believe it's the wrong approach because it allows the story to stand unchallenged. It lets the story stand without any critical analysis. People reading the Bible perhaps for the first time get there and go, what? There's no guidance. Well, today I want to offer you a new way. Well, a different way. It's actually very old, but a new way of looking at the Akeda and its meaning in our modern, troubled, misunderstanding kind of world. The post-9-11 world. The world of infants dressed as suicide bombers and of real suicide bombers and parents drowning their children, presumably because God told them. The new approach I want to give you comes from some ancient writings. Many of you, if I ask you, you know what the Torah is? If I say the Torah, Torah is the law, the first five books, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy. I'm preaching from Torah. It's the law, the law of Moses. But there is another collection of ancient writings known as the Talmud. The Talmud is a, seer, it's a whole collection of writings by the ancient rabbis, rabbis being teachers, writing how to explain and understand Torah and the wisdom literature and the Psalms and other things in the context of their world, the Talmud. You see, in the Talmud, the ancient rabbis view the Akedah differently from the way many people do just taking it at face value. They say, yes, it was a test by God of Abraham but that Abraham failed the test. The story thus is not an example of appropriate faithful obedience to God, but rather an example of what not to do. Bear with me on this. Abraham failed. And I'll explain. First, how many of you all remember the story of Sodom in the 18th chapter of Genesis? I know words have been made out of that particular name of a town. It's usually lumped in Sodom and Gomorrah. Read the story as your homework this week. When God was going to destroy Sodom, Abraham bargains with God for the survival of the righteous people in that town. I don't think there's a better word for it. What he says is, Will you indeed sweep away the righteous with the wicked? In other words, are we going to kill the good people as well as the bad? Suppose there are 50 righteous people, 50 righteous within the city. Will you then sweep away the place and not forgive it for the 50 righteous who are in it? In other words, if I find 50 righteous people, will you spare the town? So God agrees to spare it if he can find 50. But Abraham doesn't, start, doesn't stop there. He continues the bargain incrementally down until he says, what if there's just ten? But in the end, it doesn't matter. They can't find enough righteous people. But this is another, perhaps earlier test of Abraham. Think about it this way. Abraham was willing to stand up to God, to even question God's action. Will you indeed sweep away? I mean, one could say, Boy, it takes nerve to talk back to God, doesn't it? And then to bargain with God, except we do it too. But that's neither here nor there. Abraham was properly deferential to God, 
but he negotiated. He didn't take the sentence sitting down, even though he wasn't going to be wiped out. He stood up and bargained. He even, I love how he says this, Oh, do not let the Lord be angry, he says, if I speak just once more. Kind of reminds me of Columbo, in a way. Oh, there's just one more thing. Oh, one, one more thing. Don't let the Lord be angry if I speak just one more time. Suppose ten are found. The whole story, when contrasted, that story with the Akedah, was problematic for the ancient rabbis. Why, on one hand, for other people's lives, was Abraham persistent in bargaining, questioning, challenging, talking back to God? But for his own son, he was nothing but submissive. The rabbis say that Abraham failed the Akedah test because he wouldn't be similarly a persistent advocate for Isaac. Abraham simply went and prepared to kill him and offer him as a burnt offering to God. No complaint, no back talk, no question at all. The rabbis suggest that God was actually angered by this. And they don't base this on just hypothesis, it's in the, in the text. When it says that it was God who gave the test to Abraham, but merely an angel of God that stopped him. The rabbis say God was too angry to talk to him directly. Well, so the ancient rabbis surmise. But maybe they were on to something. Perhaps something that's really useful for us in our world and in our time. And that is the concept of dialogue. Dialogue. You see, prayer, our communication with God is supposed to be two-way. It's supposed to be dialogical. We speak and we listen. We ask and we understand. Jesus in the Sermon on the Mount had this to say. Remember, ask, seek, knock. For those who knock, the door will be opened. not merely that being prayer is not merely petitioning God for all the good stuff we want and forgiveness for all the bad stuff that we've done and probably are not really sorry for and whatnot. God isn't an ATM that we just put in our prayer code and we get the stuff. It is an interaction and we're real good about asking for stuff but we're not as good about listening for what God has to say. Why? Because God has tough things for us to say sometimes. Prayer is about listening to the Word of God and then asking questions of God and of ourselves about that Word. It is interacting with the Word of God. God didn't create robots that He just downloads a program and like one of those Mars rover things that they download programs and it drives around and looks at rock. He gave us free will. He gave us a brain, intellect. He put His Spirit in us. We're created in His image. He wants a relationship with us. So when we read in God's Word, or it is revealed to us in prayer, it's fair to ask, what does God mean? Now sometimes it's very, very clear. I've had times when I had no doubt in the world what God was telling me to do. Then there were some times I wasn't sure. Sometimes what God was telling me didn't make sense in the context of that particular circumstance, but given a couple of months and looking back on it, going, well, God really knew what he was talking about. I was supposed to do what it is. But ask if we don't understand. Knock for the door to be opened. What does it mean to me? Do I understand God? Does this make any sense at all? Think about it this way. The Hebrew Bible, the Torah alone, is replete with over 600 commandments, laws to be followed. And they were being followed (coughs) very, very legalistically by the time Jesus began his earthly ministry. It was Jesus who came not to change a stroke an iota of the law, as he said, but to fulfill it, to fill it full, to incarnate the Word 
the law, to make it help it make sense. And we saw in places where Jesus got downright unhappy about things. Remember the money changers in the temple. The baiting of the Pharisees who were lawyers. The Sadducees who were the upper crust, upper class people challenging him on the Word. What they weren't realizing is he was the Word made flesh. Likewise, in our Methodist tradition, all the way back to John Wesley, we hold the primacy of Scripture, which we should, God's Word. But we read God's Word in light of our experience. I don't experience God's Word in the same way that a poor person in Ecuador, a person in Southwest Asia might interpret it in their context. Likewise, our traditions, we're Methodists, but each church has its traditions as well. And our reason... God gave us big brains to think about things. And He gave us a lot to think about. But when we weren't sure, He made His Word flesh in Jesus Christ so we could see what He was talking about. We need to be well enough versed in God's Word, well enough founded in our prayer to appropriately question God. If you want to know something, we question everything else. And I'm not saying look at God skeptically, but if we don't understand what God's saying to us, ask. Jesus told us that is all right. God in writing to Malachi, in the words in the prophet Malachi's writing says, he even tells us, put me to the test. He was testing Abraham, but he says, put me to the test, says the Lord of hosts, and see if I will not open the windows of heaven for you and pour down for you an overflowing blessing. Test God. What do you mean by that? Well, what about... I'll give you one of them that's difficult for a lot of people. That has to do with putting, uh, putting God first in all of things in our lives. And it's easy to say, oh, God's number one. He's up there. I listen to my Christian radio station. I've got, uh, 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 I'm wearing my cross. I'm doing this, that, and the other. But when it comes down to it to say, all right, God asks for our first fruits. That's where a tithe comes in. Our first fruits. Well, uh, what if I can't make it that month? What if I can't afford that? Well, what we're doing is we're, we're saying, well, God's just not big enough to be able to accommodate that. GMAC is because somebody's got to pay for that truck we're driving or that car we're driving. The, the mortgage company's big enough, but I don't know about God. In Malachi, put me to the test. Have you tried tithing? Have you tried putting God first in all things? Well, what if I, you know, I just, I better not. Instead of saying, test me. I got to tell you, my experience has been when God has told me in times where it made absolutely no sense to me to do what I heard God saying to do. Every time. What's the name of that place on the mountain? God will provide. But it takes a boldness there. Because in a test, we have to stand up and be vulnerable. Now we're better off making excuses. So, put me to the test. Look God in the proverbial eye. He knows what we look like. Don't think you're hiding from Him what you're doing. One reason for this is we need to be certain that it is God talking to us and not the voice of our own corruptible conscience. I'm pretty sure I heard God say by a bass boat. I'm pretty sure I heard God say 
I need a new shotgun. I'm pretty sure God told me to buy a diamond watch. Pretty sure? I think so. Hmm. How about the voice of our own human emotions? Man, I really, really, really want that. And God would want me to have it, wouldn't he? God would want me to have that because it would make me happy. So our own emotions. How about the voice of our own troubled world? Somebody told that mother or father to dress your child as a suicide bomber. Somebody told somebody to drown children in a bathtub or starve them to death. Maybe it's the voice of some hate monger. The voice of evil. And it's not a new problem. St. John wrote of this need to test spirits when we encounter them, to be sure of them. He says, Beloved, do not believe every spirit, but test the spirit to see whether they are from God. For many false prophets have come into the world. Well, there's kind of a duh. We know there's a lot of false prophets. And a lot of them say they're Christian, and that really upsets me. By this you shall know the Spirit of God. Every spirit that confesses Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is from God. And every spirit that does not confess Jesus is not from God. And this is the spirit of the Antichrist of which you have heard that is coming and is now in the, already in the world. Test. Not Every Spirit, in a book entitled Not Every Spirit by Christopher Morse, there's, he gave an excerpt from a Christian, quote-unquote, sermon from 80 years ago. You need to hear this. Christmas is the feast of light of our ancestors, and so is several thousand years old. And just as our ancestors did not lose their fate in the coming light in the sun, despite the ice and cold of the longest night, kind of poetic there, so we took stand today in the light after long darkness. And then he came, who spoke of light, and showed them the way to the light. And then happened the greatest miracle. Germany awoke and followed the sign of light. The swastika. That was purported to be a Christian sermon. I mark that sermon as being the intersection of chilling and horrifying. Imagine believing its message without thought, consideration, or prayer. And we know what happened. Millions of Isaacs died in a holocaust. Perhaps if the parents of that would-be terrorist baby, or the countless other bombers, or the German people who actually elected Adolf Hitler to Power, had tested the spirit of those related communications from God, maybe millions, tens of millions, would not have perished and more wait to die. Perhaps that father wouldn't have starved his child to death. Perhaps Andrea Yates' five children would be still growing up. Perhaps the World Trade Centers would be standing, maybe, just maybe, just maybe. But there is light. There is good news in all of this. We have the living Word of God and the written Word of God to direct us. John 3.16 tells of what God's objective is and God's motivation. God loves us so much He gave His Son that we would have eternal life. See, God chooses life, our lives. God seeks not our death, not our sacrifice, but our eternal life with Him. That is the good news. It's also the basis of testing the spirits of revelation. If the voice speaks of love and of life, of hope and of celebration, of invitation and not exclusion, of self-giving, self-sacrificing, self-emptying rather than self-indulgence, if it speaks of authority and not power, of justice instead of hatred and injustice, if it is a voice in keeping with John 3.16, then it is most likely the voice of God. Voices that speak of hate, of violence, of self-destruction are never the voice 
of God. The prophet Hosea wrote, For I, God, desire steadfast love and not sacrifice the knowledge of God rather than burnt offerings. And Micah wrote of God saying, What does the Lord require of you but to do justice, love kindness, and walk humbly with your God? Today the voice of God invites us all to dine as God's beloved guests at God's table. To choose life and hope, and love, and to say no to the angels of hate, fatalism, and death. Choose life. Drink of the living water, and eat of the bread of life, and then go and be a bold Abraham of Sodom, working to save others as Christ works to save us. Don't be simply uncritically, unquestioning the Abraham of the failed Akeda. Pass the test of love. You know what? The answers are in that cup. Drink life. The Akeda is a problem, but the gospel needn't be. For God so loved the world. What does the Lord require of you and of me doing justice, loving kindness, and walking humbly with Him. Friends, let us do justice, love kindness, and walk humbly here, now, and everywhere. That's enough of a test for us. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Our closing hymn today, as our musicians make their way up front, is uh, from the hymnal. It's actually 697, uh, not 699. Uh, so we put it on sale. You save two cents on that. It's 697. It's My Country Tis of Thee. We're going to stand and sing the first and last stanzas of that beautiful hymn. And if there's anyone here today who would like to unite with our church by any means by which we're able to accept members, you're invited to come as we stand and sing together. Amen. Beth, you can stop the video if you'd like. Beth, you can stop the video if you'd like. The camera. Thank you.